Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. We uh, are fresh, real, and powerful here at Awaken Church. There's no lacking of realness. Um, but you know, perfection doesn't ever impress anybody, does it? <laughs> Nor does it help anyone. <laughs> so let's all just be real together tonight. I want to uh, speak on healing from defilement. You know, I preached this message or a version of this message at San Marcos when we had our cherish night. They kind of sent me up there and Pastor Michaela came down here. And I'll tell you, it was probably the, it was the hardest message I've ever tried to deliver in my life. I stumbled through it. It was extremely difficult to get out. Um, but despite myself, <laughs> the Lord used it so powerfully. And the ministry that took place, the freedom that was being received, the healing uh, that people were getting ministered in was just remarkable. And um, that I don't know if there's actually been a day that's gone by since that time where I haven't heard another testimony of what God's done in their life or their marriage or in their heart. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a message for the ladies, so it's a little bit different, bringing a message that was intended originally for just the ladies to a mixed congregation. But then the testimonies that I were hearing was that they shared this message with their husbands or with their friends, and they were so impacted and they needed to hear the message um, that I thought, gosh... I'm just going to humble myself and, and do my best to bring this to all of you tonight. And just my heart just hopes so much that it's going to bring some healing to your life. So, um, so we fully believe the scripture here, Revelations 12, 11, that says, And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So I'm going to be sharing a part of my testimony tonight. And just so everyone knows, I did not submit any scriptures to the media team. So don't worry. They don't have them, so they won't be being put up. Uh, but many of you know this part of my story, but for the sake of this new story that I really want to share with you, I'm going to revisit them, some things that I've already, you know, uh, ministered around here at Awaken Church. But, um, you know, 18 years ago, Pastor John and I lost our first baby to a miscarriage. And at that point, um, I, we were not attending Awaken Church, but my husband had met Pastor Jurgen. And Pastor Jurgen heard about, you know, what had happened and the grief that I was dealing with. And so he said, oh, John, you need to get Becky to our, our Cherish Conference. She's got to hear this minister. She's going to be ministering around that very thing. And so Pastor Jurgen actually bought my first ticket to Cherish Conference. Uh, he has always been the most generous person I've ever known in my entire life. Uh, but he, he got me to conference and the minister began to speak from the stage around her story around losing their first baby and how she was in such a deep grief. But God gave her this vision of this beautiful, beautiful young man in heaven just smiling. And she like knew that that was her son, Jesse, being that had been raised in the arms of angels in heaven. And it brought such comfort and such joy to her life that she knew she would see him again one day. And so the Holy Spirit just really ministered to her around all the grief of that and she was able to overcome that spirit of grief and, and have hope again, to believe again that she would see her son one day. And then she began shifting her message and then began talking about uh, the grief that people have experienced over losing a child through the decision of terminating a pregnancy through abortion. And so she ended up her message just kind of giving a call and said, if you are suffering from grief over the loss of a child through a miscarriage or an abortion, I would love for you to come down to the altar so we can pray for you and minister to you and help heal your wounded hearts. And I just want to be honest with all of you today that I responded to both of those invitations to come forward to receive ministry over a miscarriage and an abortion that I had had when I was 17 years old. When I was 17 years old, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship with a drug user. And even though I knew everything I was doing was wrong, um, I knew that when I had become pregnant, I knew it was a precious life. I knew life began at conception. Um, I knew everything in my head, but I was so afraid and so scared of raising a child 
um, with someone that was addicted to drugs, I made the decision that I will regret for the rest of my life um, to terminate that pregnancy as a 17-year-old girl. And I'm telling you, I need to tell you that and the climate that we're in today and all of those individuals that claim that it's health care, I need you to understand something that is not health care. There's nothing caring about it. It's like we're all cattle going through the slaughter. There's not an ounce of emotion, an ounce of care, of kindness, of tenderness, no follow-up, no follow-up care, how are you doing, how are you feeling, none of that. It's all a lie. It's all a lie from the pit of hell. It's not health care, and I don't want anyone in here to believe the lie that it is. And it grieves me this, that our current administration would fight to end the life of an unborn child until the point of its birth, and even up to 20 days after, 28 days after the baby's born. When you go to the polls, remember that this year, friends. But I responded, you know, and I came forward, and in that moment, I felt for the first time in my life that that spirit of shame left me. I'd lived under the secret for 11 years. No one knew my story. And in one moment, that dark cloud of shame and condemnation that had hovered over me, that had kept me bound to a secret, was lifted off my life. I had never felt so free in my entire life. And I think for the first time in 11 years, I was able to fully receive the all-consuming, immense love of our Heavenly Father. And when I left my shame and I left that condemnation on that altar call that day, I chose to never, ever pick it back up again because of what Jesus Christ had done for me. I was forgiven and no one could convince me otherwise. So I just, I want you to be encouraged tonight because that was just one moment. It changed the whole course of my life. God can do such amazing things in just a moment where you're in a, a moment like this with him, he can do anything. So be expectant tonight for what God can do because he has a beautiful plan for your life. He has a beautiful plan for your life beyond the disappointment, beyond the mistakes, beyond the pain, beyond the grief. And the Bible says it's a good plan in Jeremiah 29, 11. And in Ephesians 3, 20, it says that it's a plan far above anything that you could ever hope for or imagine there is a good, wonderful, abundantly above plan beyond your past, beyond the mistakes, beyond all the shame, beyond the sin, God loves you. He loves you. And so while I had been forgiven, I felt forgiven. I felt forgiven. I no longer lived under that shame. It was, it was, it was this year at the marriage getaway that God revealed another layer in my life that needed to be healed. I didn't realize there was still things lingering, lingering beneath the surface that had been a result of me, the things that I engaged in, the things that were done to me in that particular season of my life as a teenager. And at the marriage getaway, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that after 30 years, it was still affecting my life and it was affecting my marriage after 21 years of marriage. Because you see, when we walk through pain, trauma, betrayals, defilement, and we don't spiritually, emotionally, and physically heal from the experience, our hearts can become so damaged. And the heart is where intimacy takes place. So when we have hearts that are wounded, and we can try to cope by protecting ourselves, by putting up walls to protect ourselves from feeling further pain. But at the end of the day, we don't get to pick and choose what the walls do. I say this all the time. We can put up walls and for sure, they help us by protecting us. But, but while the walls keep out the bad, it also keeps out all the good. You don't get to pick and choose what these walls of protection do. So it actually can keep you from fully feeling, from fully experiencing the depth of intimacy and love and joy and peace and happiness happiness. We put these walls up to protect ourselves from a broken heart so we don't experience further pain. But those walls in the end end up hurting us. And when we don't deal with our wounded hearts, we suffer. And all the people around us that we love the most suffer too. Because our hearts have become detached. And there are beautiful people waiting on the other side of your healed heart. The people that you love, like, deserve all of you, not just, like, pieces of you. And I pray that God begins to heal hearts tonight. 
So ministering around the topic of defilement, you know, the heart is a really complex thing. And, you know, I don't want to narrow this message down to only defilement. I want the Holy Spirit, and I trust that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you. Maybe it's another area of your heart that's been damaged by something else. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will speak specifically what you need to hear so that you can leave here with a healthier heart. But I'm going to really focus on um, healing from sexual defilement tonight. And what is defilement? It's a state of being unclean, impure, or dishonored. When we engage in any sexual activity outside of marriage, including pornography, having a fantasy life, we actually come under defilement. We have been defiled. And if we don't repent from engaging in the defilement or heal from the defilement that was done to us outside of our will, the hidden roots of defilement will hinder our present relationships and our future relationships. God's design for sexual intimacy was created to be enjoyed in the context of marriage and marriage alone. Sex was never intended to occur outside of marriage, outside of that covenant. It was created for our enjoyment, for our pleasure, for our protection in our relationship, to protect against outside temptation, to procreate, make babies, and, to, and really it's to bond two people together for life. So, when, so God created it to be a spiritual act, a spiritual covenant. So the Bible says two become one flesh when they come together. There's a soul tie that's meant to attach our soul to that one person for the rest of their lives. But we live in a climate and we live in a culture that encourages us to actually live in defilement, to experience defilement, to go for it. It's celebrated, it's championed. But they don't understand the consequences that these people have to suffer because there are spiritual consequences to living a life be in pleasure of defilement. But our soul is attached to someone that we have sexual intimacy with. And God did that so we would be bonded to for life. But then there's parts of us, pieces of us that we've given away to men and women over the course of our lifetime. And there's pieces of our soul within other people. And we have pieces of other people's soul within us. And so that is why we talk about in church the importance of breaking those ungodly soul ties. To come into and repent from engaging in those things, to renounce any attachment, to break every bondage with every attachment of every soul that you have come into one with and break those agreements off. People have soul ties with obviously partners they've had in the past. They have soul ties with former spouses. People have soul ties with people that have gone to and, and have passed away. There's, not, there's, there's soul ties that aren't sexual in nature. People can have soul ties to their mother, soul ties to their father, soul ties to pets. I mean, you wonder, that's why it's so important where God says to, to leave and cleave and become one flesh with your spouse, because you have to leave that bond that you have with your parents. It's not saying forsaking or dishonoring, but sometimes those, like Pastor Regan says, those apron strings can be made of iron. Sometimes a soul tie needs to be broken there so that we can actually fully give ourselves the relationship that God has given to us for the rest of our lives. You know, many of you are probably thinking in this place, well, wow, that's really outdated. That's so old school, Pastor Becky. Who even does that anymore? That's ridiculous. You have to test drive the car before you commit to buying it. <laughs> I mean, here, okay, so let's, let's pretend for a second. Let's ignore the fact that there are spiritual, that there are soul, that there are heart things that can become so damaged with defilement. Let's just pretend none of that exists. The spiritual realm does not exist. Let's think about if we actually all lived in the context of the design of marriage that God created us to live in. Pastor Leanne shared this years and years ago, and I'll never forget it. She said if people actually only had sex in the context of marriage with one person for the rest of their life, in one day, there'd be no more pregnancy outside of wedlock. We would essentially eradicate abortion, Because a child will be brought into this life in the healthy context of a family. There would be no fatherless homes. There'd be no rape. There'd be no incest. There'd be no molestation. There'd be no pornography. There'd be no sex trafficking. There'd be no sexual abuse. There would not be a single STD. There'd be no affairs and no marriages ending due to infidelity. The pain and the heartache and the trauma people experience because of these acts of sexual defilement would literally be non-existent. 
So God doesn't create these laws to be mean and keep us from fun and keeping us from experience all these things. He's trying to protect us. Imagine a world where no one was defiled, that no one was traumatized, that no one was abused, that no one was trafficked. God knew what he was doing when he created sex to be in the context of a beautiful, loving covenant of marriage. And sadly, defilement, like I, I mentioned, is not something that we always can control. A lot of times defilement happens to us outside of our control, against our will. And I, I need you to hear me tonight that God wants to and can heal you. Just even in the moments before I left the house tonight, God gave me these two scriptures just for you. 2 Timothy 2.21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and used for the master, prepared for every good work. Psalm 71.21, You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. God wants to heal you. If you would just allow him to minister to you. There's so much honor. You are honorable. You are undefiled. You are clean in his sight. You're a new creation. So when I talked about what defilement actually is, I think saying that most of us, for the most part, would have had some level of experience with defilement in this life. We live in a very dirty world and it's hard to not get muddied up a little bit. So I want to unpack this a little bit by reading a scripture, a passage from the Bible, and sharing a little bit more of my story. There's a story in 2 Samuel 15. It's Absalom. He was the third son of King David. And he had some troubles um, as a youngster, and he made some pretty bad choices as a young man and that caused him to actually flee from his father's house, from King David's house. Eventually, over a period of time, he returned to King David's house, and he was welcomed back home. Yet Absalom's heart had already become very rooted in evil plans. And over a significant period of time, he began to turn the hearts of the people towards himself. He would wait at the city gate. And anyone that was wanting to come in to talk to King David, he's like, oh, there's no one here to heal or to hear your plea today. Come to me. If I was the judge, I would basically be like, you, everything, you are in the right, and I would make sure they were punished if I was the king or if I was the one judging. And over a period of time, just that undermining, that manipulation, people, they began to want to follow Absalom. He turned the hearts of the people towards himself and against King David. So much so that there began a revolt. Absalom began a revolt, and then a messenger came to King David, and he said, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And King David, even his most trusted advisor, betrayed him and joined Absalom. The advisor that had been with him for decades, that the Bible says gave him, it's like when he gave him counsel, it was like the oracles of God. It was always the most wisest counsel he could have ever received. And even that man betrayed him and turned his heart towards Absalom. And when David heard this, he began to gather up his household. He gathered all of his servants and he fled. But the Bible says that he left behind his 10 concubines to keep the house. So when Absalom came to his father's house, he asked his former advisor, oh, uh, wait, Ahithophel, <laughs> I had to practice that, Ahithophel, yes, uh, what he should do. Former King David's advisor trusted oracles of God, and now he's with Absalom, he betrays King David, and he says, what should I do? I'm at my father's house. And this is what he tells him. Go into your father's concubines, who he has left to keep the house. And all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. The Bible says they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof of his father's house. And he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel, demonstrating that David's house and his concubines now belong to him 
as the new king. When I read this, I understand that that meant he was now in power, he took his father's wives. I understand it from like a power perspective. But why did he want them to pitch a tent on the rooftop and bring shame and embarrassment and open defilement with all these 10 concubines on a rooftop? And when I did my research, I realized that this advisor was the grandfather of Bathsheba. King David's advisor was the grandfather of Bathsheba. So he had to be loyal to the king because of his position. But this advisor witnessed King David on his rooftop looking over to Bathsheba's rooftop where she was bathing. And he watched and he heard as King David sent a messenger to bring Bathsheba to him knowing she was married where he would defile her, have sex with her, impregnate her, and then kill Bathsheba's husband Uriah to cover up his sin. This advisor had to witness his granddaughter's pain, his granddaughter's defilement, his granddaughter's pain over not just being defiled and then having her husband murdered, but then she ended up losing the child that was uh, brought together through the adultery with King David. The pain she must have suffered, and he witnessed this. And when he had an opportunity to turn on King David, we can, you can see it right now that he left his heart very unhealthy. He harbored anger, unforgiveness, bitterness towards King David until the moment that he had an opportunity to turn on him. And don't you think it's interesting that it was his idea to pitch a tent on the very rooftop that King David saw to go defile Bathsheba on that same rooftop. He said, now I will make sure your wives are defiled, King David, in front of all of Israel. So when you think about when the Bible says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it, that act of wickedness, that act of promoting defilement in all of Israel to see came from a heart that had harbored unforgiveness toward someone who had deeply wounded him and deeply wounded his granddaughter. Unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment in an unhealed heart will turn you into the very person that you despised in the first place. So the story continues. Eventually, Absalom was killed, and the revolt ended. And King David eventually came back to his home in Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel 20, verse 3, it says, And the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion, and supported them, but did not go into them. He was not intimate with them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Such a tragic story for these women. They were left behind by the man who was supposed to protect and provide for them. They were objectified, defiled for selfish gain, humiliated in public, bringing shame and embarrassment upon them. They were victims of Absalom's sin, making them impure. So they could not even return to the king. And as a result, they had to be hidden away, shut up, condemned to a level of imprisonment for the rest of their lives. No, I'm not here to say that when we experience defilement, we're going to be imprisoned physically and shut up the rest of our lives. But what I'm here to say is that when we experience levels of defilement and pain and wounding, it's as if we can live our entire lives being shut up emotionally, being shut up spiritually, and living in bondage and lacking the ability to fully be intimate on the deepest level that God has created us to be intimate on. And so I wanna share with you what the Holy Spirit revealed to me at the marriage conference this year. Pastor Mike Connell, most of my greatest breakthroughs have come through that incredible man of God. He began speaking around defilement, something I never, again, really thought of. And, and as he's talking, about things that I didn't think I related to. I had this level of emotion like rise up and I got really emotional. I had to just start looking down. I just began like tears just began to fall off my face. And I know enough, I've been around long enough to know that when there's an emotional trigger, that's usually trying to tell you that there's something on the inside of you that is still hurting, that is wounded, that's broken, that needs healing. So I paid attention even though I didn't realize I had any connection to a level of defilement still. 
And so I'm thinking to myself, I've already forgiven everybody that hurt me. I've forgiven myself. I renounced and cut off attachments from every single person I've had relationships with. And I've broken the bondage and the soul ties. And I've done all those things. But what the Holy Spirit revealed to me in that moment, I realized was impacting my marriage for 21 years and the depth of our intimacy. For 21 years, we've, we love each other. Like we have a, a beautiful marriage, a beautiful family, a beautiful life. But there was always something on the inside of me that didn't fully feel right when I was intimate with John. And it's not, there was nothing wrong with the intimacy itself or with John or any of that. All of that was great. But there was still something on the inside of me that never felt right. And I would always kind of like drum it up to like, oh, I just must have a low sex drive. Or maybe I'm just really tired. I just need to sleep. I need to sleep, everybody. I'm tired. I have a lot happening. I just want to nap every day. And I'm like, maybe I'm just tired. Maybe that's my problem. But as he began to really speak into this, I realized in that, that moment that there was something on the inside of me that would resist wanting to be intimate with John. I could physically react, but something on the inside of me would be resisting. And I never could figure out why until this moment. Because Mike Connell says in this moment, he said, everyone just turn your palms to heaven. Ask the Lord if there's anything he needs to reveal to you. An air of your heart, an air of your life that God wants to bring healing to. Can you be willing and brave enough to ask that question? And when I asked God that question, images and memories became flooding back from that season in my life. And there was many things that came flooding back, but the one main thing that stood out to me was that after I was 17 years old and went in secrecy to terminate that pregnancy, I went back to my boyfriend's house. I was still dealing, it was within hours, physical trauma, pain, all the things that you can imagine that would, your body would be experiencing, emotional, just regretting the shame, all of it. I was in such a bad state. But within hours of terminating my pregnancy, my drug addicted boyfriend wanted to have sex. And I remember feeling like everything in me, I did, I did not want to, I, this is wrong, like I don't wanna do this, but I felt like I had to. And in that moment, I remember just say, saying to myself, I hate this. I hate the act of sex, I despise it. And, and in that moment, I realized at the conference that intimacy to me was something that was taken from you that you weren't willingly offering. It wasn't an act of love. It wasn't an act of beauty. It wasn't an act of covenant within marriage. It was something that was being taken from me. Not realizing that I had brought a piece of that ungodly belief, that lie, into the most beautiful marriage that God could ever have gifted me. And I realized that I believed that while he was the most loving, tender, kind, wonderful husband I could ever have, I still believed that this was being taken from me and it wasn't willingly a gift that I was giving to the man that God had blessed me with for the rest of my life. And so that's when I realized that internal spiritual battle of resistance was there because I had not fully healed from the defilement of my past. And I think when we look at the world, we realize that, well, when I look around, when I counsel with people, I am realizing that there is such a, and I'm just going to say the, the women in particular sometimes can really be driving the sexual intimacy in a relationship. You'd be surprised how many times we hear from the Christian men that are trying to stay pure. They want to stay pure, but it's actually the Christian woman that is pushing for deeper levels of intimacy. And they're trying to be pure, but it's literally like the woman is throwing themselves at them. And I just was thinking about this, all the defilement that's being encouraged in the world. I'm like, why is that happening? And I think so many women and men don't experience the healthy love of a father on the earth in real time, in real life. But we are, we are longing to be loved. We are longing to be seen. We're longing to be wanted. And when we don't get that from our earthly father, we look to the world for solutions. 
And the world tells you that, that men want sex and men want beauty. And so because we don't have a proper understanding and the proper love being poured and the adoration being poured on us that we deserve, we actually settle for the world's counterfeit, thinking that if we give in and give away our purity, we'll receive love in return. But that's not the case, is it? It's a lie. We don't feel loved. We feel shame. We feel used. We feel taken advantage of, and then we feel discarded. It's a lie, and so many women and men will give in to the world's counterfeit of what love is, and it's a lie. It's a lie. And so many, and Mike Connell, when I met with Mike Connell, after this whole conversation, I said, I, this is what I'm experiencing. Like, this is what I've, I've gone through. This is what I'm, I'm working through. And, and I, was, I was talking to him about this, and he just, he told me this. He said, you have to understand something. What you were actually doing was engaging in a form of prostitution. You weren't giving sex for money. You were giving sex for a false sense of love and being desired. He said, so the first thing you need to do is go before the Lord and repent for engaging in levels of defilement. Repent from that defilement and repent from exchanging sex for anything, whether it's a sense of love, whether it was a sense of security, whether it was a sense of power, whatever it was, to repent of those things. And then he said, you need to renounce any attachments to the men, and if there are many here, the women, and the memories that come along with those attachments. He said, you need to break off any agreements or mindsets around intimacy that are not aligned with the word of God. Then you need to begin to renew your mind and believe that it's actually wonderful, beautiful, a gift that God has given us to share with the spouse that we come into covenant agreement with. And then he said, you need to ask the Lord to cleanse you and remove the defilement and any residue from it. And so I had to go through that process. I had to go through that journey and I'm telling you, the Lord is so faithful and he's so good. I think sometimes even just bringing out, exposing the lie into the light, it immediately loses its power. That, that lie was so deep on the inside of me. It was so hidden, I didn't even know. But then a moment where the truth came, a moment where I allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to me, to bring up anything the Lord wanted to deal with and heal. God was faithful to do the work that he did in me. And I'm telling you, I want to encourage you. This doesn't have to be six months, a year process, a two-year process. Can I tell you, I, I processed that with God, and there was almost an instantaneous change. There is no more resistance. There is not no, there isn't any more like working myself up to be able to, to engage in this. It's a beautiful thing. And why I also want to bring this up in mixed company is because I think it will allow us to have conversations with our spouses that otherwise maybe never would have happened. It takes a lot of courage to bring these things up into the light. I remember sitting at the marriage conference and I think a few awkward people walked by the pool where we were sitting on the bench and they realized it wasn't a time to greet Pastor John and Becky. <laughs> because I couldn't hold it in. I couldn't hold the emotion in. It was like b boiling out of me. So I was like, oh, this is why I, I, I didn't realize my spirit was like resisting you. My soul was resisting you outside of my will because it was that defilement that it still had a hold on me. Remember I, had a, I told John the very things I told you, how God brought that memory back and how something that was supposed to be so beautiful, I hated, I despised, and it was taken from me. Was that hard for John to hear? Absolutely. Was it hard for me to say it out loud? Absolutely. It took a while to just finally get the words out. And I remember me just bringing that into the light. John looked at me and it, it was obviously, it was a painful moment. It was a lot of emotion, but it, even in that moment, I think it just brought healing and understanding. Because I think for 21 years, you know, not all the time, but a lot of the time, John said that he, while I never physically rejected him, he could actually feel the rejection. 
Because we're soul and we're spirit. And he said, sometimes I have a hard time trusting you with my heart because I don't want to feel that rejection and that resistance and that distance. Again, it was never spoken out loud, but he could feel it because we're spiritual people. And in the moment, I'm like, of course. Like, of course you feel that way. Like, I'm so sorry. And so can you see how if we realize that these things need to be brought up into the light, not to shame us, not to condemn us, but to bring healing and hope and restore all the, the years that the locusts had stolen. God can make all things new. He pays us back for all the years that the enemy stole from us. God can do anything. And he wants to do it for you. He wants to have the healthiest, thriving, most loving, deep intimacy with your spouse. But sometimes there's things that lie deep, deep beneath the surface, like a horror movie, that need to just come up so we can come into agreement together to smash those lies, to cancel those curses, to come out of agreement with those things, to break the bondage, to break the memories, to break all the things that haunt us. So I would just love if everyone would just stand to their feet. a little bit all over the place but I I just I think I said enough to help and I just I just want to take a few moments when Mike Connell said turn your palms to heaven and ask the Lord if there's anything he needs to reveal to you to bring a deeper level of healing to your heart would be so courageous to ask him that question tonight. So while no one's looking around, everyone, if you can just close your eyes, turn your palms towards heaven like you just want to receive the word of the Lord. This is a sacred moment, a safe moment, a divine moment. Ask him the question. He wants to heal it. He wants to set you free. He wants to restore you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to restore your honor, restore your relationships, restore the intimacy. Let's just sit in the presence of the Holy Spirit for a few minutes.
cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Have your way. Remove the things that have held me back from you. that have held me back from loving you. Help me, Lord. I need you. Oh, I need you. Heal me, Lord. Heal me now. Restore my soul. Thank you, Lord. You are faithful. You adore me. You see me cleansed. You purify me with your do it again. Heal me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Healing come. It's here. Healing come. Oh, it's You will reward. You raise me in honor once again. You're a good God. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercies that are new every morning. God, I thank you that there's no sin, no defilement that your blood does not cover. God, I thank you that you've washed us clean from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Lord, that you would correct our vision, our view of ourselves to see us forgiven God, I pray your people feel forgiven. Thank you for filling them with hope tonight of all the beautiful plans of restoration and honor and glory that you have for them. We seal this night in the power of your most precious holy name. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.